All right, Christ Church. Well, good morning. How are we doing today? All right. I want to want to start off by doing something a little bit different. So we're gonna we're gonna open with a song today called "I Thank God." So um, I just want to hear from you. Tell me something. What are we thankful for today? Shout it out. Children, life, being here, being together. Good health. Good health. Salvation. Jesus. Anything else? Come on, what are we thankful for? Church. God's mercy. Thank you. Salvation. Amen. Hey, no matter no matter what we're going through, guys, we always have something to be thankful for. Amen. Let's think about that as we stand. We're going to worship together. Let's get up and praise the Lord. Wander into the night Wanting a place to hide this real Soul, it's back home. I try with all my might, but I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting, a vagabond. Just when I ran out of road, I met a man. choice but to believe my doubts are burning like ashes in the wind so long to my old friends burden and bitterness you can just keep it moving now nah, you ain't welcome here from now till I walk the streets of gold I sing of how you save my soul. This wayward son has found a way back home. You pick me up, you turn me around, you place my feet on solid ground. I thank the master, I thank the savior, because you heal my heart, you change my name, forever free. I'm not the same. I thank the master. I thank the Savior, I thank God. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave Because he picked me up, you turned me around You placed my feet on solid ground I thank the Master, I thank the Savior Because you healed my heart, you changed my name Forever free, I'm not the same I thank the Master, I thank the Savior I thank God, I thank God I thank God, I thank God, amen. amen, awesome guys, you can grab a seat, Miss Lynn Owen's going to come up for a welcome time.
Uh, welcome, everyone. It's so good to see everyone here today. Um, man, what a blessing it is to be here. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, I'd like to invite you to grab a Connect card that you'll find in the seat back in front of you. Um, you can just fill that out. It gives us some information about you, and it allows us to send you some information about us as well. I'm just going to do um, some quick announcements. There's a whole lot going on right now, so make sure that you're checking your, your bulletin um, just to see all the events that are coming up. Uh, on Wednesday night, the senior adults will be having dinner here with, uh, looks like they've changed the menu to spaghetti, so um, they're having spaghetti at 5.30 in room 102. Uh, let's see what else we got. There's also a road trip, and I'm just mentioning that. It's May 30th, but there is a sign-up sheet in the lobby, so make sure if you want to do that that you sign up uh, in the lobby for that. Secret Sister, we just finished that, but they're starting that back up. So there's forms out there at the women's ministry table. You can grab a form and fill it in. Uh, they need to be in by May 19th. Uh, let's see what else. We've got kids camp coming up. Um, thank you so much. I, I've got a couple kids. I still need a couple more scholarships. There's a lot of you have, who have um, stepped up, but uh, we're, we're getting lots of kids from the um, after-school care program that are, are committed to come. They just need a little help financially. So, um, like I said, we got a couple open scholarships, and I know um, Cameron as well has some for his his uh, trip going to Branson in June. So just take a look at those, and if that's something that you can help with, that's great. You can, there's still time to sign up as well, so you can do that. we got VBS coming up. Just mark your calendars, week of June 17th. Make sure nobody goes on vacation that week. I want you all here on the week of June 17th for VBS. Uh, it's a big event for us. Again, um, we pull off our summer camp, so we've already got over 150 kids signed up. So it's going to be it's going to be a great event for us as well. And last but not least, um, after this service, as we do every week, Eternal Bread Ministry goes out to uh, Jackson Avenue and also downtown just to um, share some meals with those people. Again. Um, it's such, a, it's such a pleasure and an honor and a blessing for us who, who serve to be able to, to share, um, just share Jesus with them. I mean, that's something uh, we make a point uh, to do every week. We make sure that they hear uh, the message of what Christ has done for them and how much he loves them um, before they get their food, and it's just, it's just something that uh, we really look forward to. And again, God is just greatly blessing uh, that ministry. So, oh, and we're celebrating Miss Claudia's birthday. Happy birthday, Miss Claudia. 99. So, if you didn't get a chance uh, before, make sure you uh, stop by and, and give her a big hug. I know she'd appreciate that. So, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much um, just for everything that you do for us, Father. We, we take so many things for granted. There's so many things that happen in our lives, Father, that um, we think of our doing. But, Father, we know that there's, there's nothing that, um, that we have uh, that is not from you. So, Father, we, we thank you for loving us uh, even when we don't love you well. And, Father, you know, your Bible tells us that this life is... Uh, to choose to follow you um, is, is going to be a, a difficult life. It, it, it's full of pain and it's, it's, it's hard. But the thing is, Father, is that we don't have to do it alone. That you will walk beside us, Father. That you give us the strength to get through every hardship. And so, Father, I thank you for that. I thank you for that. And I, I just pray that each one of us has a desire to daily, Father, pick up your our, pick up your cross, Father, and deny ourselves and to follow you, because Father, um, that's an eternal promise that you've given us. Uh, these things of this life are just temporary, and I think we focus so much on that. Help us to focus on you and your glory and um, what you have promised us uh, in eternity. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. God is a provider, and he is able to give us what we need out of the most uncertain and unexpected situations. And so that's really what this song uh, is all about. So would you stand? Let's continue to worship the Lord together. Right away. 
honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock. There's honey in the rock.
God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. Marvelous, infinite, matchless grace, freely bestowed on all who believe, all who are lost. your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart, Lord, I'll be your vessel, the world to see your life in me. Yeah. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
just a minute and just thank God for His grace in your life today. His amazing grace. Speak to us through the message this morning, Lord Jesus. Lord, we know that there are some hurting people out there. Lord, I'm hurting, and I know those that are close to me are hurting. But, Lord, you have something for us today. You have comfort for us today, Lord. So, Lord, just open our hearts and our mind to receive that comfort from you, Lord, the great comforter. Lord, we can do nothing without you and all things through you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. So if you have a copy of the word this morning, I would like for you to turn to the book of First Peter. So we're going to go back into First Peter today, chapter 3. We're going to take a look today at maybe one of the most challenging topics, one of the most challenging subjects that there is when it comes to life, and that is marriage. Peter, like Jesus, like Paul, like John, all of them pay special attention and give special um, instruction to believers, reminding them of the sacredness and the essential nature and the importance and uh, of marriage, and then also what a godly biblical marriage looks like. What are the what are the core values? What are the principles that set us up? Not for a perfect marriage, because if you've been married long enough, you know there's no such thing. But for a good marriage, and for a healthy marriage, and for a strong marriage, and for a strong relationship. 
so in First Peter chapter 3, it's, it's interesting to me because if you remember how much we've walked through this book, and Peter has been writing to believers, primarily the Gentile believers that are in exile. Remember, they're living outside the land. They're living underneath other pagan um, governments. And he's trying to help them navigate how do you continue to live a life of a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, but when you're outside, you're still sojourning, you're still kind of wandering out there. You're not home, you're, you're in exile. And, and Peter is giving us all of this encouragement and all of these good instructions to help us. And again, that applies to you and me today because we're still in exile. We all are still in exile. We're, our citizenship in heaven has been awarded to us. We were uh, grafted into the commonwealth of Israel, part, becoming part of God's people. Remember, we've talked so much about that. Becoming his bride, his chosen bride. Again, I've, I've, I've talked about that numerous occasions from this pul pul pulpit, just showing you how marriage is, I would, say, I would say marriage is God's primary illustration that he uses to teach us about our relationship with him. So the marriage relationship is so very, very important to God. And here Peter is kind of, he's, really, um, he's not really transitioning per se, but I, I started thinking about, you know, what is, he, what is he really getting at here? Remember, he's writing to believers who are in exile, and he's trying to remind them of how important godly marriages are for not just the family, but for the church. Because the church just consists of many what? Families, right? And then from the family to the church to society at large, when you have good marriages, when you have healthy marriages, when you have strong marriages, guess what? You have strong families, you have strong churches, and you have a strong society. Which is why today especially, What's the number one relationship under the most attack in our culture today? Marriage. If God can, and excuse me, if the enemy can do anything, he's going to try to destroy marriage. Destroy families, destroy the children, destroy the churches, and ultimately it will eventually destroy the culture itself. And we're living in a day and an age where marriage is under attack. So on one hand, marriage is sacred in the eyes of God. It is the foundation of God's church. It's the foundation of society as a whole. It's one of God's greatest gifts that has ever been given to mankind. I, I, I've shared with you guys, I, I do a lot of marriage counseling. I've been, I've been able to perform several weddings over the last couple of years. I have another one coming up in June. I have another one after that coming up in July. And what I try to express to these young couples is that apart, and I believe this with all of my heart, apart from your salvation, apart from your relationship with Jesus Christ, which is God's greatest gift, we wouldn't deny that, right? Jesus Christ and his salvation is his greatest gift to you and me. But, but second to that, I believe with all my heart is marriage. I believe that this is one of God's greatest gifts to mankind given us so much joy, given us so much love, given us so much purpose in life. And so it can be the source of great joy and great happiness and great love and great purpose, but on the flip side, it can also be the source of our deepest hurt and failure and disappointment and sorrow and grief. And so just like marriage is sacred in the eyes of God, you see somebody else has his crosshairs on your marriage. And that's the enemy. That's the devil. He hates your marriage. He wants to destroy your marriage. You personally, right now, you need to, you need to understand that right now. That there's an enemy out there. He is to be respected, not feared. But he's real. He has a strategy, and he hates you, and he hates your family, and he hates your marriage, and he wants to do anything. If he can't pervert marriage or make marriage casual or non-existent, he wants to destroy it altogether. And that's why this passage of Scripture today, guys, is, 
it's heavy, it, it can be hard at times. Just me personally preaching through this is, is not easy because, you know, I have to spend a lot of time looking at myself in the mirror. Um, no, my wife is not here today, but it's not because she didn't want to hear me preach a sermon on marriage. Um, we have a family reunion every year, and um, we, typically I usually go uh, down at a little country church down in Cape County, Mississippi, um, but it's the first Sunday of May every year, big family reunion, old style, you know, country church, little tiny country church, picnic on the grounds, you know, we do the whole thing, it's really wonderful. That's where she is, she's with her mom and the rest of the family down there today, and obviously I was uh, supposed, I needed to be here, and so I couldn't be there, so she's not with us today. Um, but uh, I've, I've already been talking to her a lot about this, this message because I, I want to get her perspective, right? You know, I only have my perspective. I mean, I can tell you what the Word of God says, but personally speaking, like, I'm only coming to you from the husband's point of view. But we need both, right? We need both points of view to be able to really get a good handle and a good grasp on this. So I'm going to do my very best. You know, this is one of those ma messages that, could go in a thousand different directions. There's so much we could talk about. I'm going to try, I'm try to narrow it down to what I would consider the most important elements or, or um, you know, uh, principles of this passage. And so stay with me in this. But guys, I'm telling you, this is so, so very important in the eyes of God. So if you look at 1 Peter chapter 3, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. 1 Peter 3, 1. Peter says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they, who, the husband, when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold and jewelry or the clothing that you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and a quiet spirit for which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Be considerate, is what he's saying. Know your wife. Showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Man, there's a lot to unpack here. The first thing I want to share with you today is just a general statement that needs to remind us of the what, how God is viewing our marriages today and how he's always viewed marriage, okay? The first thing is that a husband and wife are equal in the eyes of God as image bearers. But they are necessarily have different roles and responsibilities in marriage. One of the things that we need to wrap our minds around is that yes, God created us male and female and we are made in His what? His image. Both. Male and female. Okay? We are equal. Equality. In the eyes of God, but not the same. See, there's a big difference between being equal and being what? The same. Men and women, husbands and wives, are not the same. And I'm thankful for that. You know, when I want to go out on a date and spend time with my wife, you know, that's I want to spend time with my wife because... She's not the same, right? It's not the same going out with my wife as it is going out with a bunch of dudes. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. There's a big difference there. 
So God created us equal, and, and in His eyes we are image bearers of God. And you can even pick up on that some of that here in this passage of Scripture. If you see what it says here in, in verse 7, He's talking to the husbands and He's saying, listen, the woman is the, is the weaker vessel, and I'm going to talk to you, what, the, what does that really mean today? It's not an inferior description of our wives. It doesn't mean you're inferior to anyone. It means that, you know, I'll get into that later, but look what he says. He says, since they, our wives, are heirs with you of the grace of life. Did you ever consider what it is, why the Lord decided that after he created everything, six days, all the animals, he created man in his own image. And then the very first human relationship that God created was what relationship? Marriage. Before God did anything else with the human race, he took a man he created woman, and God walked that woman down the aisle. You ever consider that? Eve did not have an earthly father. Who presented Eve to Adam? The Lord did. I'm giving you a way. Now take this man, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and you two will become united as one. Right? The man will leave his father and mother, be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh, and God created the institution, the, the relationship, the marriage relationship before anything else. So that tells us what God's priority is in life, and I've already said this, but I'll say it again. That's why marriage, guys, is so important because it is the foundation for every other relationship in life. Children and churches and uh, uh, societies and communities and everything else in the world is built upon the foundation marriage. So it is essential in God's sight. So here's the thing, guys. You don't have to be a believer in Jesus to get married, obviously, right? Marriage is a human institution. It, 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 it is universally applied to the human race, whether you're a believer or not. God created us male and female. He said, I'm giving you a helper that is fit for you, as he told Adam, that it is not good. Isn't that interesting? As you look through the Genesis account, back in Genesis 1 and 2, the, everything that God created was what? It was good. Everything. Until he gets to Adam, and he's looking around, and Adam's hanging out with all the animals. He's like, you know what? Something's not right. Something's missing. It's not good that Adam is what? alone. So God, in his beauty and wisdom, said, I'm going to create a helper for him, somebody to compliment him, somebody to come alongside him, to, to be there with him, to build a life together, and all the wonderful things that come with this marriage relationship. And so it is a human relationship. It is a human institution, if you want to use I don't really like that word institution because it sounds so, like, regimented and like you're doing it out of obligation. But it is, in a sense, it is, a, it is an institution, just like the family, just like government is in, and the church. These are all things that have been created by God, ordained by God. So you don't have to be a believer to be married. So this, this idea of marriage and good and godly and healthy marriages um, can apply across the board to every culture and society, no matter who you are. Now, obviously, I, what I believe is that you can't really give your spouse what they need, and they can't give you what you need, ultimately, unless you are first in a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Like, you can love people, and you can be a good spouse, and you can be a good parent, and you can do all those things without the Lord. You can, okay? I'm not denying that. But you can't be the best person that you can be, apart from that relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But then, for believers... In the book of Galatians, let me just share this with you real quick from Galatians chapter 3. Specifically for believers, again, speaking of this equality in the sight of God, listen to what Paul says. He says, for in Christ Jesus, you all are sons of God, or you're children of God, through faith 
For as many of you who were baptized into Christ have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male or female. Interesting. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs, there's that word again, you're heirs according to the promise. So what is Paul saying? Is he saying there are no gender-defined roles as male and female? No, that's not what he's saying. Is there no such thing as Jew and Gentile? No, he's not saying that. Slave and free, do we still have slaves in the world today? More slaves in the world today than there's ever been before. Did you know that? But what is he saying? He's saying these secondary things that we identify as are, are, are they're, that's what they are. They're secondary to the primary identity that we should have. And what's our primary identity? To be in Christ. And that as we are in Christ, that is what brings us together and unites us as God's sons and daughters. So that our primary identity is that I'm not a husband, I'm a son. My wife is not primarily a wife, she's first a what? A daughter. And that is where a godly marriage, the foundation of understanding, the unity that God desires for his children to have together, brothers and sisters in Christ, that, 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 that our, our identity is in Christ above all things. And then secondarily, we, are, we wear those various hats, husbands, wives, moms, dad, whatever job you have, brother, sister, aunt, uncle, whatever, all those other things. Yes, those are important to us and those are part of who we are. But what Paul is saying is there's unity for all of us in Christ so that we are what? Equal. We're equal, but not the same. Not the same. So let's take, let's take a closer look at 1 Peter 3. My second point to you today is so let's, let's talk first to the wives, okay? We'll talk first to the wives. Ladies first. Let's see what Peter says. A godly wife prioritizes her inner beauty above her outward appearance and willingly, this is key, guys, She's willingly placing herself in whose hands? God's hands. Very important you get this. She's willingly placing herself in God's hands under the authority of her husband. There's a big difference. You're not necessarily placing yourself in your husband's hands as your authority figure, if you want to put it that way. But what God is calling you to do, wives, and I, and I, and I have tremendous respect for wives. Because ultimately, if we're operating in, the, in the, the design and the purpose and design that God created from the beginning, is that he's asking you wives to willingly trust him, trusting him, by putting you underneath this knucklehead's authority. Just be honest. Okay? And I know you wives love that because, like, yeah, my husband's a knucklehead, right? But see, if, if, you're not, if you're not seeing it from that perspective, then you're going to resent that knucklehead. But when you see it from a different perspective, you say, wait a minute, this is God calling me to align myself underneath the ordained covering that he has placed me under, and if I'm willing to do that, it requires a tremendous amount of trust and faith in God. Because you're, you're willing to submit to this imperfect person. Not necessarily because he's always right. Not necessarily because he's always got it all figured out. Not necessarily because he's always going to treat you the right way. But because this is the way that God designed the family to operate. Okay? Now I want to say something too. The Bible never says that women should submit to men. Never says that. See, we get you get people that struggle with these verses and they rip it out of context, and you're saying, You're telling me that I'm I'm a woman, I'm supposed to just submit to every man. No. What does the Bible say? Wives, submit to your 
own husband. If he's not your husband or your boss, I'm not telling you to submit. Pastors have a, have a, a, a responsibility and a role as spiritual leaders. And the Bible talks a little bit about that. We've talked about that in here. So they're, they're every, and this is the thing. We all, whether you're a husband, a wife, a woman, a man, everyone has to what? Submit to someone. Everybody. No, nobody is exempt from submission. So submission, see, this is where in our day and culture, submission is, is a bad word. Unfortunately, we've turned this into a, a, a dirty word, a bad word, and we, we, we want to kick against that or reject that, guys. But if you see it from God's perspective, he's saying, listen, this is for your blessing and this is for your benefit. This is how I designed and created the family to operate because, guys, there's nothing worse than a two-headed monster. Nothing worse. And so we're going we're gonna to unpack this just a little bit, and, and we're going to try to do our very best. And this is so wonderful, guys. I want you to see it. Wives in the room, I want you to hear this. This is a beautiful thing. As God created Eve, and she, he took Adam, and who was alone. He's like, it's not good. I need to create. And he uses a special word. He says, I want to create a helper suitable for him. The, the idea suitable is kind of like a hand that fits in a what? In a glove. A suitable helper. And what you see here in this picture is that what God was doing is that he was wanting to bring about what we call compatibility or complementarism. If you want to use that big word. We complement each other. We're, we're created to be what? Compatible with each other. But here's a, here's a little nit, a little pet peeve of mine. I don't think we're created to complete each other. You ever heard the, the two young lovebirds falling in love, you know? Oh my gosh, he completes me. He's my everything, right? Oh, she completes me, right? Let me tell you something, guys. No, you might com be compatible with her or him. You might, you might be complementary to her or him. But guys, who's the only one who should complete us? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, and I think that's where a lot of relationships go wrong is because if we're looking to that imperfect person, whoever they may be, both of us are going to be imperfect in the marriage relationship. And if I'm looking to this person who's going to let me down, disappoint me, hurt my feelings, you know, whatever it may be, if I'm looking to that to complete me, I'm always going to be disappointed. I'm always going to be left lacking. But if I look to the Lord and say, God, you know what? Even if my spouse dies, which many of you have experienced that, even if we don't work out, even if they're not being the person that I need them to be right now, I'm not dependent on that person to fulfill me, to, to leave me satisfied. Just like we just sang, right? Honey in the rock, only God can what? Satisfy. And as long as you're okay with that, then you can become the person that God wants you to be. But God is the only one to complete us. But he created husbands and wives to complement each other. And here's the beautiful thing. The, the, the word helper, a suitable helper. Wives, I want you to hear me in this, okay? Because I used to joke about this. Is that sometimes, husbands, you can identify with this. Is that, you know, you're like, you know, I don't really need the Holy Spirit in my life because... My wife is always telling me what's wrong. Can you identify with that, guys? Like, who needs the Holy Spirit when you got your wife, right? But I'm going to tell you something. I started looking into this a little bit, and you know what? There's a little bit of truth to that. Because a wife is called a man's what? Helper. Who else is called the helper in the Bible? The Holy Spirit? Hmm. Then I really started to get convicted, right? I'm like, okay, wait a minute, so what does that mean? Think about the roles of the Holy Spirit in your life. The Holy Spirit is a comforter. Why? You're his helper. You should be his what? Comforter. The Holy Spirit is called our counselor. What's a counselor? Somebody that has wisdom, discernment. See, what did I say? We're knuckleheads, right? We don't know. 
we can't pick up on that stuff. We're, we're just out there in la-la land. We're just trying to do whatever we're trying to do. Wives, you have this amazing sixth sense called discernment, right? The little antennas go up. You can be around somebody for five minutes. You can walk away and say, hey, I don't like that person. Something's what? Something's wrong. I used to think my wife was crazy. It took me like 10 years because she would tell me stuff, and then I started looking back, and every single time she would be around somebody for just a few minutes, pick up on something because of that sixth sense, that wisdom, that counsel, she would tell me about it. I'm like, no, you give everybody the benefit of the doubt. There's nothing wrong with them. Guess what? Every single time she was right. Every time. And guess what? After about 10 years, this knucklehead started to listen. Because she serves a role as a helper where I'm not even in tune with that kind of stuff. God's given her that ability. What else does the Holy Spirit do? The Holy Spirit is our advocate. Wives, how many of you are your husband's advocate? Or are you his biggest? See, this is, this is there, there's, there's pluses and there's good, there's positives and negatives when it comes to this. But, but when you get into this idea of a, of a wife, guys, it's amazing how God, yes, there is a role of a helper here. And many of the positive characteristics and gifts that God gave you as wives are to be used to encourage. And, and the, the helper is our encourager, right? The encouragement and the wisdom and the comfort and the advocacy that we need. And that is part of what happens. So here's, here's what we got to see when it comes to this relationship. Is that a wife, again, is respecting God's design for submission and authority. Now, I'm not going to spend time to go there, but if you want to have what I think is the greatest thesis on marriage ever written is Ephesians chapter 5, and Paul is talking, it's very similar language as it is here in Peter, right? So I'm not going to go there, but I just want to say this. In Ephesians 5, Paul basically breaks down the marriage relationship into two things. He's saying what women, what women, what our wives need more than anything else is to be loved, to be cared, okay? Be loved, nurtured, cared. But do you know what? Men don't need to be loved more than anything else. What do men need more than anything else? To be respected. Hmm. But see, that's, that's a dynamic that often gets confused because, you know, let me give you an example. Like we talk about in the marriage relationship, unconditional what? Love. Like our role as husbands are to love our wives sacrificially like Christ loved the church, giving ourselves to our wives, and that we are supposed to love our wives even when they don't deserve it. Isn't that the definition of unconditional love? And we all say, yes, amen, we agree. But when it comes to respect, hmm, many times what I see and hear is a wife will say, well, you know what? I'm not going to give my husband respect unless he what? Unless he deserves it. See how that works? Just like a wife needs unconditional love, a husband needs unconditional what? Respect. Does that mean you have to agree with everything he's saying or doing? No. But when a husband is acting in an unrespectable way, just like a wife needs to be loved when she's acting in an unloving way, guys, listen to me, a husband needs to be respected even if he's acting in an unrespectable way. Way, but see, we put conditions on respect. We're not supposed to put conditions on what? On love. This is one of the biggest things that I see in a marriage relationship because it's very, very hard. So let me give you the two areas, ladies, wives, where we struggle the most. I say we, where I would consider you struggle the most. The first is with your words. Look at what look at what Peter said. He says. Be subject or submissive to your own husband so that even if they do not obey the word, so that maybe they're not, they're not serving God, they're not being faithful to God, they're, they're just, you know, they're not being the husband that they need to be. Look at what it says. That they may be won over without a what? 
without a word. But how do, how do most wives, let's just be honest, how do we think we're going to win over our husbands or get them to do right? First thing we're going to do is tell them. Let me tell you what you're doing wrong. Let me, let me explain to you. Right? And how's that working out for you? <laughs> so there's something here. So, so the temptation is, Wives often struggle with their words. And let me tell you why. So this is, this is very, very important, all right? Generally speaking, and we're, we'll get into this a little bit later, women are the weaker what? The weaker vessel. doesn't mean you're inferior, okay? But from a, let's just talk purely physical. Physically speaking, women, on average, are much weaker than men, right? Different body types, different strength capacities. So a man physically can dominate his wife if, if he wants to be that abusive person. He can win the fight physically. So wives can't win the fight physically. So how are they going to win the fight? With their words. It's the only weapon they got. It's their defense mechanism. And so this is your, this is your way to try to maintain some type of control when you're afraid or insecure and you see that all this language is in here talking about um, not to be afraid he says he says if you do good do not fear anything that is frightening and I think that that's where many of our wives are in relationships where they are afraid and they don't feel safe and they don't know what to do and they want to try to maintain some kind of control and the first thing that they're going to do is they're going to try to use their words to do that and I'm going to tell you something about words words are powerful powerful this whole sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That's the biggest lie that's ever been told. I would rather somebody punch me straight up in the face than say something that's going to cut me to the heart. I promise you, I can get over this a lot longer. This right here may stay with me for a lifetime. Your words are powerful. That's why James talks about like taming the tongue. And here's the thing that we have to understand is that your words, wise, they're going to bring either life or death into the relationship. And m most men or husbands, in my experience, when it comes to the love languages, and you guys know what the, the five love languages, you've heard me talk about that in this room, in the, you know, from this setting, but there are, there are different love languages, and most men, one of their primary love languages just happens to be words of affirmation. Well, I'm going to give you a little secret. You ready? Husbands do not need very much. I promise. I mean, you you know what you know what I think it boils down to as a as a husband. You know what we we want ultimately. We just want to be appreciated. That's it. I don't need I don't need anything else. You talk to husbands today. Ask them what what do you really need from your wife? What what are you looking for? What's your biggest desire? Man, I just want to come home from a hard day's work, and I just want to be what appreciated. It's not that hard. It's really, really simple. And these words can be so very, very powerful. And so this is one of the ways that, that, that our wives get into trouble because they, they use those words sometimes and abuse those words and can be very critical and very complaining and very dis disrespectful. And again, guys, this is not going to get your relationship anywhere. It's just going to build more and more resentment in your relationship. But that's why it's going to be the hardest thing for you to do. It is. Bite that what? Bite that tongue. Hardest thing in the world to do. And the second one that, that Peter talks a little bit about, about here is it's going to be that temptation with your self-image. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I really, I, I really hurt. I'm burdened for, for ladies in general, especially our young ladies, because what our society has done now more than ever is that they, it has reduced you ladies to nothing more than what you look like on the outside. If you're not pretty, according to the, uh, the culture standards, and you don't have certain qualities, physical qualities, then you're, you are not worth anything according to our culture and our society. And so I can't imagine what it's like being a woman, a lady, a wife, in this day and age and in this culture where you're constantly needing to be reassured, are you pretty enough? 
I'm, I, I can't imagine what you're going through, especially our younger ladies who are growing up in this, in this day and age, in this culture. And so it, society reduces women's value to how young and beautiful that they are. And so what, what happens here is that what Peter's reminding these wives in the church, he's saying, listen, he's not saying that you shouldn't take care of yourself. He's not saying that you shouldn't try to be presentable, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying make sure that your primary focus is not on the what? Outward appearance, but you're focusing more where? On the inner, inward appearance. What, what are, you, are you beautiful inside and out? Be as beautiful as you can be on the outside, but are you beautiful on the inside? You see, this is where a wife can often struggle, and they're so concerned and so obsessed with how they look on the inside, and they're afraid of getting old, and they think my, my husband's not going to be attracted to me anymore, and all of these things play into it. But let me tell you something, guys. Wives, listen to me. You fight this battle by looking in the mirror every single day, right? Checking the new wrinkles. You know, you, what do you try, a new product that you got to buy, whatever it may be. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says there's another mirror that you should be looking into every day. The book of James says that the word of God is like a what? A mirror. So instead of you spending too much time looking at the physical mirror, looking at the outward appearance, make sure you're spending time with the Lord looking at the word of God because you know what you're going to find out in the word of God? It's going to show you and tell you who you really are going to remind you that you are a beloved child, a daughter of the king, and you are beautiful in his sight. And that's what attracts our, uh, your husband to you, is that inner beauty more than anything else. And that's the mirror that you want to be concerned with more than anything else. So wives, I, you have a tremendous value, you have tremendous power and influence over your husband and your entire home. And again, I could speak probably weeks and weeks, just on that one relationship um, uh, itself, okay? But we're going to move on because I, I'm, I need to get going. So let's go to the next point. So let's, let's talk husbands. Let's talk husbands, okay? A godly husband is the spiritual leader of the home, and he exercises strength under control and he's supposed to sacrificially serve his wife in humility. Look at what it says. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Be considerate. And you're showing honor to the wife as a weaker vessel. Now, I've already talked about this a minute. But I, want to, I want to emphasize it once again. You see, husbands are called to set the tone. To set the, the spiritual and emotional temperature of the home. That's what a husband's really called to do. Lead by setting the tone. A husband is called to be strong. Strong. Strong emotionally. Strong physically. Spiritually strong. Mentally strong. Okay? But here's the thing. A husband is not to use his strength as a means to abuse or to lord it over his wife but he uses his strength under control. You see, there's a Bible verse in the book of Matthew where Jesus says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And that word meek is fascinating to me. Do you know what it means? It means to have strength or power under what? Control. See, we think meek, we think weak. Meek does not mean weak. Meek means you have tremendous power, you have tremendous strength, but you have that under what? Under control. And this is where, when we come to our marriage relationship, men, husbands, and we're willing to sacrificially serve our wives and be humble and lay our lives down daily and go the extra mile and be there to nurture and make our wives feel emotionally safe and financially provided for and all of these things. And this is what I, basically the bottom line of all of this. How many wives would be jumping at the chance to willingly submit to their husbands if he was there to nurture and provide for them and protect them and serve them and remain humble in God's sight and was there to be the strength and the rock, the spiritual leader of that home. How many wives are not going to jump to follow that kind of man? Of course they are. 
You see, because when men, when we're leading the way that God created us to lead our families, I don't see any wife in the world that's not ready to say, I'll follow you anywhere. I'll follow you anywhere. You see, this whole happy wife, happy life stuff, that's a lie. If mom ain't happy, that's not true. You know who I hold responsible for happy wife, happy life? It's the husband. If, you, if you're in a home, a dysfunctional home, or an unhappy home, or an unhealthy home, you know who I'm going to look at first? The husband. Because if there's something wrong with his wife, and she's not flourishing and blossoming, and she's not, she doesn't feel like she's at her best, it's probably because her husband is deficient in something. He's not doing what he's supposed to do to set the tone to be spiritual leader of the home. So it's the husbands that this responsibility falls to. And I think that it always has been. Now what Peter says is that husbands, you are to know your wives. So this is, this is going to be our last little part here for husbands. So I want you to really, uh, really tune in with me right now. Okay, you ready? Husbands, he says, live with your wives in an understanding way. That, that word is gnosis. <clears throat> to the Greek word. <clears throat> it means husbands, know your wife. So you don't have to answer out loud, but here's, let me give you a couple of examples. Husbands, do you know what your wife's favorite color is? Do you know what her favorite drink is? Coffee shop is? Do you know what her favorite restaurant is? Do you know what kind of music she likes to listen to? What are her dreams and aspirations? What is, what is she most in, afraid of and insecure about? What does she enjoy to do in her free time? What stimulates your wife intellectually? What makes her feel loved and appreciated? What moves your wife emotionally? You see, if you're a husband in the room today, you are to what? No. No, your wife. And this is where many husbands fail. Because we think, okay, I won the prize. I got married. That goal is over. Now it's time to move on to what? Other things. My career, whatever it may be. No, husbands, you know what you're called to do? Date your wife. Study your wife. God knows they're always changing. You got to study them, right? You got to pick up on that, that, that language, that hidden secret language that they talk about. How you doing? How you doing, baby? Oh, I'm fine. Does that mean fine, guys? No. It does not mean fine, right? We got to know that kind of stuff. You pick up on those things emotionally, right? You pursue your wife. You, you try to connect with your wife. You seek intimacy with your wife. Not just physical intimacy, but like real intimacy where you're, you're trying to get to know what's going on in their life. You listen. Listen to your wife. Be considerate. Be kind. Be gentle. Be patient. And here's a big one. Husbands, you're called to reassure. reassure. You know what our wives need more than anything else? They need reassurance. It's going to be okay. I'm not going anywhere. I'm here for you. I'm going to take care of this. You are beautiful. You are loved. You are cherished. You see, we reassure our, because they are battling a lot of fears and insecurities and all the things that we've already talked about. So that's, in a sense, what it means for the wife to be the weaker vessel because, yes, physically, in many ways, obviously, you wives are weaker. But I'm going to tell you something. In many ways, wives, you're what? You're stronger. Because anybody that can carry a baby nine months of term and go through what you go through, I give you hats off to anything. You're stronger than anybody. I couldn't do it. There's no way on earth. Sometimes, many times, wives are emotionally stronger. They, again, they have that sense of discernment. So there's many things. And so here's what we're getting down to, guys. I know I'm running out of time. But what, the way God created the marriage relationship to work is that there's many things that a husband is going to be lacking. And the wife comes along, and she compliments him. And what he's lacking in, she's probably going to be strong in. And there's many things that a wife is going to be lacking, and the husband comes along, and he's strong in those areas, and so he comes along to compliment the wife so that the two are better than, yeah. So when we come together, this is the way that God created and designed the relationship to be. So we, we're, we're created to work together as one flesh. The last thing I want to share with you, again, is this, because so many things that I could talk about. But my last point is this. As our marriages go, so goes our what? So goes the future.
sociologists, psychologists, politicians, doctors, educators, will tell you the number one determining factor for a child to end up drop out of school, on drugs, in jail, or dead, but for the age of 25 years old, the number one factor is the disintegration of the nuclear family. A child that's being raised in a home with a single parent, as much as single parents do, I know how hard you work, I know you're doing the best you can, but again, just the overall numbers is that when marriages begin to fail, children begin to fail. When children begin to fail and, and families begin to fail, society begins to fail. So guys, what we're seeing right now is a true detriment to society, to the church, to everything around us, because as our marriages go, so goes our future. We, you know, how do we fix it? How do, we, how do we change it? You know how we change it? We have married couples that are saying, we're committed, we're going to get through this, we're going to show our children what it looks like to stay in this thing, to work it out, no matter what we've been through. I know it's been through all kind of difficult situations, but we're going to try to set the example for our kids to show them what it looks like to stay together, to stick it out, and so that our kids see an example of a godly marriage, not a perfect marriage but one that seeks to honor God, the one that seeks to want to do what God designed us to do and gave us purpose to do. So that our children can, can go into the world and maybe they can continue to carry on that, that example of marriage when they get married and they say, you know what, I saw my parents and they weren't perfect and they had their issues and they had their struggles, but you know what, they did not quit. They did not quit. And we, we do everything that we can do starting right now because if you see the spiritual implication, and this is the last thing I'm going to share with you guys, you see what Peter says. What does he say? He says that husbands, that you, look, you consider your wives as heirs with you of the grace of life so that your prayers, your prayers may not be hindered. You know what, you know what marriage is? It is the front line. Listen to me, guys. Marriage, the front line of spiritual warfare. Marriage is the front line of spiritual warfare. Where is the enemy concentrating the majority of his attack, the majority of his assault? I promise you. It's coming at you. It's coming at me. He wants to take out your leaders. He wants to take out the churches. He wants to take out your parents. He wants to take out everything that he possibly can do. And that's where he is focusing most, if not almost all, of his energy and effort to destroy the family. And God is saying, we've got to focus on what God has done and provided and designed for us as husbands and wives. It's not easy. It's hard. But it's worth it. Because as Warren Barfield said, love is not a fight, but it certainly is worth fighting for. I'm going to ask Deanna if she'll come up. We're going to finish with one more song, guys. And listen, pray for, your, pray for your marriages. Pray for your family. Pray for your children. Pray for their future spouses. Pray for yourselves. Because everything that I just shared with you today, guys, is all well and good. And, it, and it's true, but it means nothing unless we take the word and we go and what? you got to go do it. you got to humble yourself, okay? And so we're going to sing one more song today. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, bow your heads as we pray. We're going to pray together. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for just this word today. It was, it was hard, it's difficult because it, it forces me to see all the areas of my life where I've failed, I've, I've let people down, I've struggled. But Father, I know that your grace is sufficient. I know that your grace is enough. And just like you are patient and kind with us, Lord, help us as husbands and wives to be patient and kind and gentle and loving and forgiving, Lord, with one another. As you've given us this marriage relationship, as a, as a place for us to learn how to become like Jesus. That's what it's really about. 
It's this where we are, it's the training ground for us to know and learn what it means to be like you, Lord Jesus, because you are married to us. You call your church your bride. And you have to be so patient and so forgiving and so gracious and so kind with us, Lord, so compassionate and understanding. And Lord, help us to see that, see each other from that point of view. Protect our marriages, Lord, protect our homes. We need you, God. Our future needs you. And we ask this in Jesus' holy and perfect name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, guys, we're going to sing one more song this morning. Would you would, let's stand together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever will be. Great is thy faith. God's people said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Let He cause His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, lift up your countenance. Lord, we need your favor. And give us peace.